Say, can we do work on molten salt reactors? And the, 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 the response will come back. We can't do work on molten salt reactors because we just don't know enough about how molten salt reactors work. Well, I would like to prove how it works. It's like, yes, we'd like to help you prove how it works, but we don't know how it works. Well, can we find out how they work? No, because we don't know how they work. It's like, what? This is John Kutch. John is the director of Thorium Energy Alliance, which holds a yearly conference coordinating thorium research. They did not get funded, by the way, at Los Alamos. He and his wife are both physicists. They're both excellent researchers. They did that on the weekends by themselves. And education. The, at so, universities, usually course development comes out the initiative of one or two professors getting together. We're sitting at a Chicago patio after touring Argonne National Lab. Hey, hey, buddy, that thing there, yeah. At Argonne, sodium coolant was seen as the future of nuclear power. Sodium, uh, coolant. sodium, sodium cooled pressurized water reactor has to take uh, 2,000 psi. Uh, which is a really thick pipe. You know, it's typically four to eight inches depending on the diameter of the pipe. Whereas here, it's, uh, it's relatively thin pipe. You know, the maximum thickness is, uh, is uh, perhaps an inch or an inch and a half. Take the fuel, you chop it up, you process it electrochemically, uranium plutonium mixture right. mm. to go in the next plant. Right. Right. Whereas at Oak Ridge National Lab, molten salt coolant was seen as the future of nuclear power. I'm the U.S. rep in the International Molten Salt Reactor Program. It's a really good heat transfer agent. It's even better than water. And with a boiling point of 1400 C, even looking in the solar areas, people want to be moving into the liquid salts as their, as their primary heat transport media. Both liquid sodium cooled reactors and molten salt cooled reactors are capable of consuming recycled spent fuel rods from today's light water reactors. Currently, the United States has about 70,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel sitting in cooling pools and storage casks. Between stockpiles of depleted uranium, spent nuclear fuel, relatively abundant uranium-238, and incredibly abundant thorium-232, there is absolutely no shortage of fuel for either liquid sodium or molten salt reactors. But the United States is not pursuing either one. The safest nuclear reactor being constructed in the United States is the Westinghouse AP-1000. This will be the United States' 105th light water reactor. The AP-1000 stands for Advanced Passive. It incorporates a number of new safety features. Everything was to simplify, simplify, make it robust through simplicity. There is a large amount of water that is stored at the top of the containment building. Other than that, most of the features of the AP-1000 are very similar to existing reactors. I mean, it's better. I mean, if you want a light water reactor, that's what we should have been building 40 years ago. But the, but the fact that it took them 22, 23 years to get through NRC approval for what basically is just a good old design is insane. It's insane. Start. Two, one, boost to ignition, and liftoff. You know, the shuttle was a magnificent technology development in 1981. Part of the problem was the U.S. held on to the shuttle for 30 years. Until finally President Bush had to say, we're going to stop doing it. And that was a huge adjustment for NASA, was to try to figure out what are we going to do if we don't anchor our entire psyche around the notion that we fly the shuttle. And I think there's a parallel there with the light water reactor. You know, we built a hundred some odd light water reactors between the 70s and the 80s and a few into the 90s. As you've seen from our visit to Oak Ridge, there's talk about extending those reactors 60 and 80 years. All that castle simulation stuff, how to keep making LWRs go forever. This calculation here is looking at a fuel pellet that might have a chip in it. And what would happen is that you operate with a chip in you, and a fuel pellet, what would happen to the cladding and the stress on the cladding? And you get into the same sort of argument of diminishing returns. How long do you hold on to the old technology? You get a gap in here, the rod can vibrate and wear a hole. Dr. Alvin Weinberg, who had a huge part in developing the light water reactor, begged several administrations from Kennedy to Nixon to please, this is what a civilian nuclear reactor should be. You should use thorium and you should use molten salts. In every other field of technology development, we're happy to see an improvement of technology. Nobody wants 1950s computers, nobody wants 1950s cars. Why are we satisfied with 1950s reactors? This plant has a secure place in American history.
It is the first of the world's large-scale nuclear power stations exclusively devoted to peaceful purposes. In 1957, Shipping Port began providing 60 million watts of electric power. A watt is a measurement of continual energy production or consumption. You've probably got a 60 watt light bulb installed somewhere in your house. Shipping Port's output of 60 million watts could continually power 1 million 60 watt light bulbs. Today, an American household continually consumes an average of 1300 watts. We use less when we're sleeping, more when we're awake, but that's the average. And this has been holding pretty steady since 1980. All of our appliances and light bulbs keep getting more efficient, but we also buy more types of stuff that didn't exist before. And we get multiples of things we used to own only one of. Do you have a television? Well, yeah, you know, we have two of them. You must be rich. Oh, honey, he's teasing you. Nobody has two television sets. So today, shipping port 60 million watts would be enough to power 46,000 homes. By today's standards, 60 million watts isn't much for a power plant. Ever since the late 70s, each nuclear power plant has been providing around 1 billion watts of power. Today, a single light water reactor can meet the electrical needs of 770,000 homes. But nuclear power output per plant has stopped increasing. What has improved since 1980? Cheaper to build? No. Cheaper to fuel? No. Cheaper to operate? No. In the world of nuclear power, not much has improved. For contrast, let's compare nuclear power to computing power. They kind of look the same. Oh no, wait! We're showing computing power using a logarithmic graph. Those are powers of 10. Computing hardware has been constantly evolving from vacuum tubes to transistors to silicon chips and will go on to optical and quantum computing in the future. But what if we'd never advanced beyond the vacuum tube? What if the computer industry was somehow structured, regulated, and incentivized so that the concept of a microchip was treated as nothing more than an academic curiosity? If the future is vacuum tubes, well, you best put all of your effort into making the fastest, most reliable, least expensive vacuum tubes you possibly can. No doubt a 1950s vacuum tube still had room for improvement, but only to a point. Computing power would have stalled, just like nuclear power. The world we know today of portable electronics, wireless internet, and GPS navigation could never have been invented. Univac Scientific, Univac File Computer, Univac Punched Card Computer. Each of them capable of literally 2,000 mathematical calculations per second. In terms of energy, that is the exact world we inhabit today. A world that has not yet been remade by access to efficient nuclear power. A world that continues to burn more and more fossil fuel every year. We're still living in a world of vacuum tubes.